Good morning. Well, I am so thankful to be here this morning to talk about our ongoing series, Everyday Mission. And today, we are going to specifically be talking about the mission that God has us on around the world, to the ends of the earth. And quite often, you know, we think, we think hey, we're on a mission in our families, we're on a mission in our church and as a church, we're on a mission in our cities and in this area, in this region. We're on a mission in Wisconsin. We're on a mission throughout this, the nation. But there are many other nations around the world. And God has called us to take his good news to the ends of the earth. And this morning, we have an opportunity to talk about God's desire that we would live as sent people. Uh, we either are sending people or, the one, or we're the ones going. Those are our options as followers of Jesus Christ. We either get to join his sending team or get to join his going team. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And I'm excited not only to unpack a passage from Scripture, but to also uh, invite a friend of mine, Don Biggie, uh, in a little while, he'll come on up, and I have some questions for him. Uh, Don has a passion for world missions, and uh, Don and I have partnered for the sake of the gospel. Uh, I, I think we met probably 24, 25 years ago, something like that. It's been a while. Um, and we have been on great adventures together. And uh, one time, here's a, just a brief funny story. One time, I brought uh, headphone or uh, earplugs because I knew that Don snored. And I thought, you know what? I am not going to last a week on the mission field sleeping in the same room as Don. And as we're, as we're boarding the plane... I'm thinking, you know what, I could use these earplugs one of two ways. I said, I could either stick them in my ears or up his nostrils. And I thought, hey, um, that, might be, uh, that might be a better approach. It'd be more comfortable for me, you know, if they weren't in my ears. I didn't do that. The thought did cross my mind. Uh, but we, as the Church of Jesus Christ, have this awesome, grace-filled gospel message to, de to deliver to a world that is desperately in need of a Savior. And as we get started this morning, I'm going to just play a brief video, and I want you to contemplate what this guy is saying on this video. There is a phrase often quoted that goes something like this. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Now the purpose of this verbiage is to incite courage within followers of Christ, that they might not just proclaim Jesus with their lips, but reveal him with their lives. The only problem is that there are two detrimental contradictions within this little piece of advice. One is that good news must always be shared with words, and two, is that our actions preach the opposite of the gospel all the time. Because really, this quote does more to excuse our shame, laziness, and impassivity than it does to call us to boldness, action, and authenticity. Basically, what it leads us to thinking is, if I live a good life, people will believe Christianity, which takes works-based salvation to its furthest extremity. Because now, you're not just trying to save yourself by good deeds, but all humanity. However, both are an impossibility. You see, your goodness can't save yourself, and it can't save anyone else. What everyone else needs is what you needed too, and that is the proclamation of the good news. That is the spoken gospel. That God was open while we were hostile. That only because Jesus was broken is salvation made possible. That the power of death was stolen when he conquered the grave's obstacle. And that it is by grace our hearts were woken and by grace will be made incorruptible. That 
is the news that's good even when we are not. So may our lips never fail to preach what our lives constantly fail to model. Let us preach the gospel at all times, necessarily as a spoken gospel. So the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is in the word of God. It is not anything that we can do. Um, if you, like I've said many times, if you follow me around, you'll see that I'm a sinful person. It won't take you long. You'd figure it out quickly. My life does not model what the gospel represents. But the word of God has the power to transform lives. And this morning, my hope and prayer is that as we read... Uh, the next passage here, found in Romans chapter 10, um, that these words come alive, that these words grip our hearts. And I'm actually going to start in verse 11, uh, so a few verses before what's on the slide. It says, uh, for the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they be called will they will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him for whom they have not never heard? And how are they to hear? without someone preaching and how are they and how are they to preach unless they are sent but it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news but they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says lord who who has believed what he has heard from us so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So if we look at this passage, um, it gives us some clear direction. It talks about the end goal at the beginning, people being saved from their sins. And it says, how can they be saved if they, if, how can someone be saved if they don't believe? And how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how can they hear if someone hasn't preached a message of truth to them? And how can someone preach if they haven't been sent? So, um, this past week, I was studying the realities of reverse engineering. And that is looking at a finished product and saying, how can we end with that finished product intact what does it take for us to get there and this happens in social engineering across our country where people are saying the end game what we want is we want you know healthy whole communities how are we going to get there from where we're at how are we going to get there and if we look at this passage in romans chapter 10 it unpacks the reality that our end goal is we want people to be saved but how does that happen? So if we reverse engineer this, it actually gives us a blueprint as the church. How should we be sent out into, into the uttermost parts of the world? How should we be sent out on this gospel mission? And first of all, we need to become a church and continue to be a church day after day after day that is sending. Continually sending. Like I said before, you're either one of the sending party or one of the going party. You have either option. Either option is fine. To not go, though, is not an option. You're either sending or going. But when you're sent, you are preaching a gospel message to the people. You're saying, okay, Jesus came and died so that you might have life in him. Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians talked about us and our identity as stamped as we are living in Christ. We are alive in Christ. We are alive because of Christ. So when we are sent, we are sent with a message. 
We are sent with a message by a king, our God, who wants us to proclaim that message so that people can hear. And when they hear the message, they'll have the ability to believe. And after they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll have the opportunity to be saved from their sins. So if we look at this passage and reverse engineer it very quickly and realize, okay, we need to be a sending church that preaches the gospel. And when we're sending and preaching, God does something miraculous. Did you know that as the church, we can't save anyone? We have no power to save. So some people would say, well, if we have no power to save, then why go? Well, the power to save people from their sins is alive in us through the power of the Word of God, through us. It's not us doing the saving work of God. It's God doing His saving work through us. So as we are sending, we're either sending or preaching. We're either sending or going. And as we are sending and as we are going, God is going to do a mighty work through us. It's not us doing a work for God. It's God doing his mighty work through us. We're a vessel. In our family, we call this pipe theology. If you take a piece of PVC pipe, let's imagine that I have a piece of PVC pipe that has a hole in one end and a hole in the other, and imagine that you pour water in one end, it's going to go flowing out all the way through the pipe and out onto whatever is around the pipe. This is the same thinking that our family calls pipe theology. We're the pipe. We are not the living water. Jesus pours his living water, his message, in through us. His message goes out from us to those around us. And it's not our message to carry. It's his message that we have the opportunity to carry. And as we go, people are going to hear and as they hear, people are going to believe. And as they believe, people are going to be saved. And it is a great opportunity for us to join God's gospel mission to this broken, broken and hurting world. God has a plan. Now, how he's going to carry out his plan, we don't necessarily know. Last week, I shared that example of me trying to make my best effort to do beach evangelism in my college days, and I was in Daytona Beach, and I was so excited to share the gospel message, but I got flustered, and my words got all messed up, and I was tongue-tied, and I told the young man, you know what, I'm so sorry, I'm wasting your time, I'm wasting my time, I'm going to just go back to my hotel room, take a shower, and call it a day. And he said, no, 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 I'm understanding the message for the very first time. I was sent by my college to go. I was attempting to preach a message of hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but my tongue was very tied. But thanks be to God, the power of the Holy Spirit was at work in, through, in and through me, not because of me. In my weakness, he was made strong. And this young man said, wait, wait, wait. For the very first time, I'm understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep talking. I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to stop talking. If you understand it so clearly, explain it to me because I don't understand the gospel right now. Help me. And he was able to clearly communicate back to me from Scripture, from Scripture passages I was attempting to share with him, he was able to share with me the hope of the gospel. And that indicated to me that I was sent, I was faithfully attempting to preach, and in my weakness, he was made strong. And this young man heard the gospel message, and not only did he hear it, he began to believe, but he said, you know what, I still have doubts. So that day, he didn't pray to receive Christ, but a seed was planted, and we were able to connect him with a church uh, back near his college. And I don't know whatever happened, but God does. So in the midst of our humanness, God will reveal his faithfulness. In the midst of our brokenness and our tongue-tied words, God in his powerful gospel will continue to redeem people. And he'll do this 
through his church as we live as his sent people on a mission to proclaim a gospel. And proclaiming that gospel means that we proclaim it not only with our actions, but also with words. And God not only desires that we do that, he desires that his whole entire church worldwide reaches out with this gospel of hope to the world around us. And I have had the privilege of going to Ecuador uh, about six times to help plant churches in that country. We'd always partner with a parent church that had a desire to see a daughter church planted. And God, by His grace, allowed that to happen. Because of His faithfulness, churches have been planted, not only in Ecuador, but in many countries around the world. Uh, my friend Don Biggie is a part of E3 Partners, a ministry uh, that reaches many, many countries. I don't know how many countries around the world, but uh, many, many countries by planting churches that, that proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to take an opportunity um, to ask Don a few important questions as we continue on with this morning's service. And Don, if you want to come on up, uh, like I said, Don and I have known each other, I, I think it's about 24 years. And you know, I'll grab a mic for you. So Don and I met as a church was planted in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Um, I met because I was the drummer in a worship band on launch weekend of the church that Don was, at, was pastoring at the time, South Shore Evangelical Free Church. And we met and shortly became, uh, quickly became friends. And after a brief um, time, uh, I ended up working with Don at South Shore Evangelical Free Church. So our, our first question is, um, how have you seen God work in, people, in people's lives around the world? I didn't know about the earplugs. I, I thought I'd save that for you. Here. I didn't know about that. I'm traumatized. <laughs> By the way, young people, don't get any ideas about taking earplugs on your mission trip and putting them in somebody's nose, okay? It wouldn't be good. Anyway, I, I'm all right. I'll, I'll be okay. How have I seen God work in people's lives around the world? Um, the encounters with the many, many thousands of people that, that I've had the chance to, to work with over the years... I'm the strategy director for Russia, so I've been back and forth about 60 times um, to that country. And, you know, the folks are, are just like you. I can remember just one quick story about a young lady named Alessia, who I met when she was 17. And Alessia had been abused by two fathers, her natural father and then a stepdad. So when she met us, she met us in a university. We were looking to find people to interpret for us. Russia's, Russian's a tough language. And so that first year at age 17, we saw her cry a lot. She was crying all the time and kind of wondered why. And then she opened up what was going on with her life. She was atheistic, but she was willing to help us, right? In year two, she continued to cry, but some of us became like uncles and dads to her. Um, she started to learn what it's like to be loved. Um, at age uh, 19, um, God gave her a mentor, a woman, to pour into her. So there's, here we have a mentor coming into the relationship. At age 20, she received the Lord. At age 21, she's now leading a small group, teaching a Sunday school class, interprets for us, and helps me train pastors and leaders as an interpreter. Uh, that all happened in about four years. And so I could share that story again and again in people's lives, you know, just, just individuals who are so madly loved by God that, that these are the kinds of stories we have the chance to see, unfold, and share with others. So, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, well, our second question uh, is, how have you changed as a result of being involved in world missions? I, I've seen, uh, by the way, I've seen a huge change in Don in his dependence on the Lord. So I know that there has been change, 
not only in people in Russia and other various countries, but changes in Don uh, that I've witnessed. But how would you say you've changed over the last uh, number of years? Um, <clears throat> have you ever been just out of answers, out of energy, out of solutions, and you find yourself completely broken and dependent upon the Lord? It's when you come to the end of yourself and even when you come to the end of this idea that the salvation of unsaved people among the nations of the world is on you, that's when the Lord reveals his greatest passion. You know what it is? I mean, he loves the lost, but his greatest passion is not just to convert the lost, but rather to fill the world with the knowledge of his glory the way the Waters cover the seas. And so the Lord replaced as my number one priority the needs of the lost with the desire he has for global glory. And it's out of that passion that God has to make himself known globally that he can use folks like us to explain that and bring people to Jesus. So I think that's one of the, re the ways that, that I changed. So dependent upon him that it just drove me closer to him and discovering his goodness and uh, the things that are really on his heart. I thank God for that. This morning on our drive up here, uh, as we were talking, uh, this foundation of dependence on the Lord, that's what I've seen change in Don over the years, is he started being involved in missions because of his heart for the lost. But now um, his heart for a close-knit relationship with Jesus is what fuels his entire life. So the salvation of people isn't dependent on Don, and Don's identity is not dependent on people getting saved. His identity is anchored in who he is in Christ. Mm -hmm. And as he goes into the world, God is going to use him. God is going to work through him to reach people. Like he said, he's been over to Russia uh, 60 plus times and Russia is some hard soil Russia is not an easy country uh, to go to like I said I've been to Ecuador uh, six times and people in Ecuador have a concept of God they understand God uh, they're hungry they're in uh, dire straits many of them and so they see their need for a savior and they're almost ripe for the picking you know it's, it's like you can go down there, you share the gospel, and people are like, I want to follow Jesus with my life. Russia is a complete, completely different culture, and that really leads us into the next question. Uh, what are barriers to world missions? Now, there can be barriers in specific countries, but there are also barriers within the church of the United States. But, Don, what would you say are barriers to world missions? There are issues of culture and language among the 11,500 people groups in the world. Uh, those things need to be overcome. If you're healthy, they can be overcome. But the barriers really have more to do with its, what's in our hearts. The number one lie of the devil, he's a liar, by the way. I don't know if you notice that. He's a father of lies, full of nothing but untruths. Number one, God cannot use you. You, he can't use your life. You just don't have what it takes. That's one thing. But another thing is this idea that this doesn't include me. I find that in churches all over the country, when I go and share, that there are those who simply believe that um, the Great Commission is not for them. Being a disciple who makes disciples is not a call on my life. You know, I'm here to be a cheerleader for the pastor to root them on and the praise team as long as they keep it up, you know, in a way that I like, that kind of thing. And just that idea that, that in the Bible, the central character in Scripture is not me. I mean, I'm in there and so are you, but the central character is the Lord God Almighty. And we have a missionary God. The author of Scripture, the story of the Bible, is Lord's love for the world, his desire to redeem it. He is the central theme and his mission, the central theme of the Word of God. That needs to be retaught, I think, and reintroduced 
to churches so that we see our identity and our part in it. So those, most of the barriers have to do with what's in our own hearts. So I'm, I'm assuming that even among us here, there may, some, may be some barriers, uh, maybe some lies that we're believing that might be a barrier for us to jo- for thinking we can't join God's mission. We might say, you know what, I'm disqualified because of a past sin. No, you're not. We are all called to go into all the world and make disciples. And if God were not able to use broken people, he'd have none of us to use. We're all broken. If we look at the heroes of the faith, if we look at uh, Moses, if we look at David, if we look at Paul, if we look at all these biblical examples, uh, they had pasts that could have easily caused them to think, you know what, I'm disqualified from making disciples. I need to clean up my act and I need to get everything right. And once everything is right, then I'll be able to step forward. That's not reality. The reality is God wants to use us right where we're at. And he wants us to take his gospel message, even in our brokenness, and share it with other broken people. And it certainly um, could be barriers, but we don't want uh, those barriers to stop us. We want to uh, build bridges where there are barriers. It's kind of like, imagine there's a wall going up. Let's build a bridge over that barrier and say, you know what, God, instead of me being kept from your mission, how can you empower me? How can you stamp me with a Christ-centered identity so that I can go out with the hope of the gospel, not on my own strength, but empowered by the Holy Spirit? Um, One last question is, how can people become active in world missions? Okay. So I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Don? First of all, recognize that this is what you're redeemed for. Not just the comfort of heaven, but to be purposeful on mission in the world. It starts with your own mind and with your own heart. I'd recommend, there's a course called Perspectives on the Christian World Movement. It's a 15-week course. They can be set up. You can have missionaries come and teach it for you. It'll give you the view that God has for redeeming the world, his plan Biblically, culturally, historically, and strategically. Very, very good thing to do. But the second thing that I would do is before I jumped off, if I was unsure of my motives, or if I was a little shaky on what I think ought to happen, what the expectations are, step back, ask the Lord to examine your heart, study the scriptures that have to do with God's passion for his glory. Let that really fill you up so that when you go, when the time comes to go, It'll be an overflow of your love for God. It'll be an overflow of your worship life as opposed to just trying to do something out of duty or obligation. It really begins with the heart. Mission trips can really be tough on folks who are there for the wrong reasons. So I'd begin there. Yeah, it's a good place to examine our own hearts and our own motives. Why are we doing what we do? And really say, okay, Lord, reveal any wayward way in me and help me understand, help me be properly motivated so that I'm not going so I think somehow I am a better Christian because I went. I'm better than those that didn't go. That's not a truth. The truth is God wants to send us and we're sent as his ambassadors into our families, into our churches, into our cities, and into the world. God has given us this everyday mission to continually take his gospel to the world. And I know that he desires to do that through you. If he has saved you, he has saved you by the power of gospel for the purpose of the gospel. He has saved you from yourself so that you can join God in what he's doing. And it's not an obligation. You don't have to, you get to. Like I've talked about many times before. This isn't an obligation that we're pouring on you This is an invitation that God is inviting you to join his redemptive work to see lost people saved and to see those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ sanctified by that same gospel. We we don't clean ourselves up after getting saved. What happens is he continues his saving, well, we're saved, but he continues his sanctifying work 
in us, and, but also through us. So, Don, thank you so much uh, for pleasure. being willing to come up this morning. Um, if you have any questions about world mission, uh, Russia, um, or any other country for that fact, for that matter, um, Don, I'm sure, would love to talk with you. He'll be around after the service. And I want to drive this point home. We are either sent or we're going. So we either need to be a part of a sending team or a going team. Many of us in this room have sent missionaries out, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Many of us also in this room have had the opportunity to go. But this is a continuing work of God in our lives. He wants to continue to send people out from his church so that those that go proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and people come to know him as their Savior and Lord. Many countries around the world need great uh, help and encouragement with carrying out the mission. But other countries are also sending missionaries to our country now, nowadays because our country is seen as a country that desperately needs to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Don, thank you very much, and um, thanks for taking the trip up here with me. The whole idea of living on an everyday mission is I want all of us to see ourselves, first of all, as missionaries. We are missionaries sent by our God with a powerful message called the gospel that has the power to save people from their sins and sanctify those of us that are followers, continually making us new so that we, we look more and more like Jesus Christ as life goes on. We can't do that on our own strength. It's not that we were saved by the power of the gospel and then we have to clean ourselves up. We couldn't do it. What we can do is surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, continue your work in me, but also, Lord, I want to join what you're doing. I want to, empowered by your Holy Spirit, go into the ends of the earth and carry your gospel message. So that is a high privilege. That's something we don't have to do, we get to do. We are his sent missionaries on his gospel mission. So let's pray in that direction. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be your own. Lord, we are your children, saved by grace. Lord, we are your kids, and we have an opportunity to be your ambassadors. Lord, help us realize that you are alive and well, you are living in us, and you desire to carry out your gospel work through us. Lord, it's what you've decided to do. You've decided to use broken people to reach other broken people. It's your way. So, Lord, I pray right now that as we continue in this service, Lord, that we would realize that we are worshiping the mighty God of all creation who can and does transform lives. Lord, continue your transforming work in our hearts. Lord, rightly motivate our hearts. Help our hearts line up with your heart for this broken world. And Lord, carry out your redemptive mission through us, your church. And Lord, we pray all of this in your mighty and powerful name. Amen.